These graves bear witness to one of the most momentous and poignant events of the 20th century. The Allied invasion of Europe on June the 6th, 1944, was the beginning of the end of World War II, but it involved a tragic loss of life on a scale not seen since the Somme and Passchendaele. Americans regard this, their own cemetery, as a sacred place, 9,000 silent testaments to the bloody realities of war. This place and its veteran survivors are the subject of Steven Spielberg's new film, Saving Private Ryan. Audiences have flocked to see it. It's as if the world's most famous filmmaker has tapped into their nervous systems and taken them back to the bloodstained beaches themselves. What happened here 54 years ago was a nightmare which still lingers. From the very beginning, everything for the Americans at Omaha went tragically wrong. Tempestuous winds turned the sea into high rolling waves. Aboard the landing craft, men were tortured with seasickness. Bluffs and sheer precipices 200 feet high provided the Germans with an almost impregnable natural fortress. Every square inch of beach was intended as a killing field. Lost in thick cloud, Allied bomber support never found their targets. Heavy wind and drift tides scattered the American landing craft. Amphibious tanks sank where they were launched. As the ramps came down, all hell broke loose. Men crumpled where they'd stood from the spray of machine guns and mortar fire. Others simply drowned. The lucky few scrambled over the dead. With the incoming tide, the surf turned red. In front of them was a deadly sprint across shingle and barbed wire to the seawall. As Colonel Taylor declared, two kinds of people are staying on this beach, the dead and those about to die. The story to Empire Ryan is really the story of a terrible tragedy that happens on June 6, 1944. Not just the tragedy of D-Day, but the tragedy of brothers killed in action very close to the same day, uh, a couple of them on the same day. When the Department of the Army gets the information that the mother of these four sons is going to receive three telegrams informing her that three of her sons were killed in action that the General Marshal um, uh, sends a squad of men to search for Private James Ryan with the intention of decommissioning him and getting him back to his mother. And that was the center of the story that really attracted me, the search for Private Ryan and the deep moral, the troubling moral implications uh, 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 about that story. Move fast and clear those murder holes. Marching plenty of feet between men. 
five men, it's a juicy opportunity. One man's a waste of ammo. Get the sand out of your weapon. What struck me when I first saw this film, uh, it, no other picture has made me cry in the first five minutes. Usually crying is something that you do at the end of a film in some way, but you don't introduce your characters, you don't introduce the audience to them, you throw them into this carnage. Why did you deny yourself that dramatic possibility? Well, I found a more dramatic possibility in creating a kinship between the audience and the citizen soldier. And the way to do that, in my, in my mind, was to put the audience inside those landing craft, those Higgins boats, and when those ramps come down, the audience, anonymous to each other, and the soldiers, equally anonymous, are sho sort of shoveled onto those beaches into that terrible inflating and crossing fire, and that the audience experiences the same thing the soldiers really experienced in time, you know, 54 years ago, many of them who didn't have a chance um, and many of them, probably 90% of them, who had come right from basic training and never before had seen action. What kind of archive film did you use uh, to clue you into that kind of imagery? Well, you know, what really helped more than anything else was the eight surviving stills that Robert Kappa, the famous photojournalist, took of the first wave uh, of, on Omaha Beach. And, and, and those eight sh stills are, are pretty amazing. Uh, they're, they're not out of focus, but they're kind of shaky. There's ghosting around the images because he was running and he had a shutter open and things were shaking. And, of course, when he took a picture, it came out almost like five exposures on, on one subject. And I kept saying to my cameraman, Janusz Kaminski, I kept saying, God, we got to try to duplicate those Robert Kappa photos. we got to do what he did, except we're doing it 24 frames a second on movie film. And that was the first ins inspiration for me. Everything else was researched. You used this very interesting phrase. You said that you wanted to de-glamorize the, the techniques that you used. Uh, could you tell me some of the more unusual things that you did with camera and sound in order to uh, affect the shell shock in the audience? I did a lot of things like um, desaturate the color. The film is in color, but the film is very faded. So the film looks authentically period. It looks like a 1940s color picture would have looked 50 years, 54 years later, um, I shot with an open shot with a 45 and 90 degree shutter, camera shutter. What that does is it deglamorizes uh, sequences by getting rid of all out of focus blurring. You know, often when when somebody runs through frame, it's kind of beautiful because they kind of streak and they blur. N not every frame is in focus. If you look at every frame one at a time on a, on, a, on a film, you see that only several frames are in focus. Most of it's out of focus. When you shoot with a 45 degree shutter, every single frame. 24 frames per second is in focus, which means that, that coupled with my vibrating camera, I had a vibrating lens called a shaker lens on top of our other lenses, and I could press a button electrically and create a, a shake in the lens and take my finger off the button, the shaking would stop. All those things made the film nervous to look at, which is exactly the kind of fear that the soldiers were feeling inside of their, the, themselves. You do here is die, covering fire! Some of the camera stuff is rather subtle and it's hard to explain, except on Schindler's List I had used the handheld camera. I decided to do this on Schindler's List for the first time in my entire career, to use a handheld choir uh, camera for, let's say, the liquidation of the Krakow ghetto and, and, and many of the scenes in Birkenau, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, so there's, there, there, are, there are key moments throughout Schindler's List of pockets of docudrama, cinema verite, that was very important for me to, once again, destroy that distance that the audience finds to be a safe distance between between historical horror and their perception of it. And the closer you can get the audience to the imagery, the more of an impression it makes on people. You mentioned uh, John Huston's film, The Battle of San Pietro. Now, what what was it about that picture that influenced the, the, this, this kind of realism that you've achieved in Saving Private Ryan? Um, that John Huston's camera crew wanted to get back to, their, to their, their wives and moms. And so rather than standing up to get the perfect high shot that would show the most production value and put the most American infantry into the frame, they stayed very close to the ground. And often uh, uh, the star of some of those shots was the weeds and the, and the micro 
uh, you know, and, and the inches of, of grass right in front of the lens because they were not willing to go any higher. And they'd hear a, a crack of a rifle to the right, and they would whip hand to the camera to see a soldier actually having just been shot a second ago falling to the ground like a sack of flour. Saving Private Ryan, to me, whenever it looked like a mistake, it wound up in the film. I'm mainly talking about the combat scenes. If it looked like that shot was an accident, that shot was just a once-in-a-lifetime, had to be at the right place at the right time, the cameraman pro probably got killed in capturing the images, but the film survived. Whenever I could say that about an image, I was very proud to put it in the film. Were you aiming to uh, be more brutal than anything that went before? Well, that's really not for me to say. I wasn't, that wasn't my original intention, just to be brutal for brutality's sake. I wasn't trying to do that. I was simply trying to, 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 to show war like it was and like it is. And, and like I said before, I've read a lot of testimonies from veterans of that war and seen documentaries and talked to them in person. And, and they all said there were two wars fought. There was our war. And it was Hollywood's war. Can you find it in your heart to tell the story of our war? And when they said that to me, I was an instant convert. I said, yes, I will tell the story of your war. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be as, 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 as conventional to your experience and unconventional, therefore, to the American Hollywood experience as I possibly can be. And sure, there's all sorts of conventionality throughout part of my movie, but I try to be as as, as conventional to, the re, uh, to, to a real-life war as I possibly could be. I was thinking there, when th that brought into my mind this film that you say is the second film that ever made you cry, a, a guy named Joe, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which is also, of course, set during uh, the World War II period and which you remade, as always. Mm -hmm. Now, that is it's a beautifully made film by Victor Fleming, but it seems to be doing the opposite of what Saving Private Ryan's doing, which is saying... Yes, there, there is death and suffering in war, but uh, war is a transcendent thing. There's a great speech from Spencer Tracy mm -hmm. at the beginning talking about the, almost the spiritual nature of mm -hmm. flying. And you don't want anybody up there with you. You don't want anybody to spoil it. Everything's kind of still. And you have a feeling that you're, you're halfway to heaven. You don't even seem to hear the sound of your own motor. Just a kind of a buzz, like the sky was calling you. Like the sky was singing you a song. Yeah. And somehow it's never eight o'clock up there. It's, it's always now. And the earth is so far below you that it just doesn't matter anymore. The sky is the thing that's important. The sky is your path. Is this not feel like contradictory for you to admire and love this picture, but make the opposite sort of picture? No, because that picture spoke to my heart. That picture, I never thought the picture was realistic. I thought the picture was a piece of heaven-sent poetry. And it so captured my heart that I wanted to tell it for modern-day audiences. Um, um, not at all. You know, I, I think that was a different kind of love letter. I, I didn't write a love letter with Saving Private Ryan. I was I'm more, more, more likely I wrote a letter home. This film, Objective Burma, famous film with mm -hmm. Errol Flynn, mm -hmm. caused a major international incident because it portrayed the, the war in the Burma zone as a purely American war. Boy, am I glad to see you. You're glad. We gave you up for lost. Yeah? You're all right. You did fine. Oh, thanks. Say, uh, the light? You've no idea how important blowing up that radar station was to us. Here's what it cost. Not much to send home, is it? A handful of Americans. Do you think there's a danger that American films have Americanized World War II? in general, not portrayed it as an international conflict properly? Not really. When you see films like The Great Escape, I'm talking about more recent war films where it was certainly American-Canadian, mainly British. When you see the original, you know, Daryl F. Sonic production of D-Day, which was more of an overview of that war. It, it took everyone's point of view, the French underground, the Canadians, the British, the Americans, the Germans. It was, it was basically shot from all angles. Therefore, for me, it was not a personal film at all. It was just a big 
uh, uh, kind of you know, you know instructional video about 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 you know tactics and how that war was fought with except for a couple of very poignant you know you know personal moments um, um, that film wasn't my favorite of the World War II movies made um, no I don't I don't think so but I think you know every country should tell stories about their own history the British certainly have made some of the greatest pictures about World War II you know, um, including Dam Busters, which is one of my favorite World War II films ever made. That's fine, steady. Steady. Bomb gun! I didn't believe a word you said, but now God, you can sell me a pink elephant. I think that we are responsible for telling as much about what we know and who we are as possible. And we expect that of everybody else who has a story to tell. But American war films have made mistakes, haven't they? They've made a, the, some of them, the least good ones, have been too jingoistic. Some of the John oh, Wayne, John terribly, Wayne pictures, oh, yeah. awful. Yeah. I mean, I mean, but you have to understand. Let's go back to the source of those World War II movies. The original World War II movies made from 1941 to 1945 were were were, were basically propaganda films inspired by the op, you know you know the Department of War Information under Roosevelt and aimed directly at the studio honchos in Hollywood to help the war effort by making movies that would give people courage so they would then support the war. Remember, Americans, almost to a person in the 1930s, were isolationists. We were non-interventionists. We did not believe in, in, in joining the war in Europe. We did not want to. Charles Lindbergh led that charge. Roosevelt was re-elected on, uh, on, on a non-intervention platform. But then, when we suddenly realized that, that, our, that our fate was sealed and we had to come into that war, you know, Roosevelt needed to look good because he was changing his mind. And a lot of voters voted for him because he said, we're not getting into the European war. And so Roosevelt turned to Hollywood to make it seem okay that Roosevelt had, had broken a promise. When we were denied access to France, we went to uh, you know, John Major's government and simply asked, you know, could we get some cooperation through John Major's cabinet in gaining cooperation uh, from the British Army to help recreate all those battle scenes throughout the entire film. And uh, our request fell on complete deaf ears. We actually uh, had problems getting an answer, and the, the answer finally came back with a very curt no. We, we are not going to cooperate um, at, at all with you. Um, and I was kind of shocked by this, and I, I, I certainly didn't know anybody in John Major's government, but Richard Attenborough had kindly introduced me to uh, Peter Mandelson and Tony Blair, you know, uh, several years before the election. And when I spoke to him before he became prime minister, and I kind of told him that we, that John Major's cabinet had said definitively no to us, um, he said, well, you know, I, 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 had I been prime minister, if, if I could be prime minister, I certainly would have gotten you all the introductions you needed to the British Army. Do you think the British in film industry and the British economy lost out under Margaret Thatcher and John Major as a result of not being friendly to filmmakers? Well, I, I just know I, I just know from experience because look, I've made ten pictures in the UK, uh, produced produced and directed ten films, starting in 1980 with Raiders of the Lost Ark and George Lucas before that, in '76 with Star Wars. So we know how we we've been treated over the years, and we've been treated wonder. MPs have been wonderful to us. We've had some of the greatest treatment from MPs on both sides. Um, um, but in terms of the 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 head honchos. You know, I, I don't feel that Margaret Thatcher's government, you know, cared, a, cared at all about the arts. And I don't feel that John Major's government cared very much about film. In what way did uh, your father in some ways stimulate your imagination about what World War II was? 
Well, my, you know what my dad did for me was talk about it all the time. My grandparents talked about the Holocaust constantly. That's how I heard about that. Because my grandmother taught English to Holocaust survivors in, in, in our own home when I was like three, four years old. So I, have direct, I had direct contact as a three, four-year-old child with actual survivors of, of, of the Holocaust. And my dad talked about World War II because he fought in Burma against the Japanese. He was the radio operator aboard a B-25, and he had many missions to resupply the British there. Um, he only had one combat mission, but I think because he only had one combat mission and never lost anybody close to him, he could talk about it. But so many of the veterans who went through the kind of hell that was Monte Cassino, Salerno, you know, um, um, uh, 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 the Normandy beaches, all of them, all five of the landing zones, uh, um, the Pacific War, the veterans there, and veterans of Vietnam too, have not been able to really speak uh, uh, openly about it without causing them terrible pain. So I really understand why those who didn't experience that much could talk more than those who did. And did your dad ever give you a graphic sense of what it was like to be at war? My dad saw a, uh, you know, one of his, one of his, one of, one of uh, the B-25s in his wing or in a squadron had crash landed and the plane caught a fire. Not everybody got out. My dad didn't know everybody in the squadron. You're talking about thousands of people. Um, and my dad raced, raced, rushed up to the burning B-25 to help. And there were a couple, couple of men who were already dead and trapped inside. And my dad told me the story while we were actually barbecuing in Phoenix, Arizona. And he was like turning over the chicken. That was, and the chicken was sticking to the grill. And I remember him saying, you see the chicken sticking to the grill. How, I'm having trouble getting it off. He said, that's how we had to get the bodies out of the airplane. We had to use almost a putty, putty knives uh, to, because the bodies had fused onto the middle inside of the fuselage. And that was maybe the worst thing anybody ever said to me. And I was, I was young, very young then, and I had never heard, I, I, I had no defense protection from an image like that or a graphic m analogy like that. And it, it was very disturbing. And that was one of the first times I recognized the difference between the, mo a motion picture about war and perhaps an actual testimony about a real war. When you were a boy, like Ameri many American boys, you were very into World War II. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why are boys so taken by this um, very traumatic event? I don't know, you know, why, why, why boys are and girls aren't. You know, uh, boys and girls play with dolls, but except that girls play with dolls with dresses and boys play with dolls with army uniforms and helmets or, or, or alien creatures or or uh, ninja warriors. I mean, I mean, there's a whole kind of, you know, a mini macho uh, uh, experience that happens with very young. I have seven kids, so I watch all of them evolve, and they kind of quite naturally. And I've always said about young kids, we all begin as filmmakers. Every single child put on the on the on the earth begins as a director or a writer, and also an actor, because what do we do with our toys? We lay down on the floor. We put our eyes lower than the toy. We try to make the little figure of a, of a soldier look much larger than life by looking up at them as opposed to down at them like that. We hold another soldier out in, in the distance, and so now you're kind of directing a nice split focus composition. And you're only five years old, and you're going bang, 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 like that. I, I, and then you're doing dialogue, and you're saying, you know, you know bang, you're dead, I mean, whatever you, you would say. And so we all sort of begin our lives and yet we don't have the technology to capture those moments. We kind of enjoy the pleasure of creating um, conflict or creating, you know, uh, um, a comedy. Uh, and we do that as children. And uh, uh, many, most of us don't make that, take that necessary step to find some, some force of technology to bring into the force of imaginative nature and capture those images forever.
the men in your films are often quite uh, weak. They're not. They're, they're anti-macho men. I'm thinking of in Jaws when Richard Dreyfuss does that with the, <laughs> with the cup, cup yeah. you know, and that sort yeah. of that makes fun of the macho yeah. mentality. Yeah. And you have said that you were a kind of nerd at school in some way. Mm -hmm. Could could war movies be a kind of fantasy fulfillment for for men who felt marginalized from the group of guys? Well, you know, I, I, I sure they could. I guess they could. Um, Maybe it was like that for you. I don't know. You know, I, I, I was certainly an outsider. But a lot of my films weren't just war films. A lot of the films I made as a, as a, as a teenager, you know, were comedies, were horror movies. Didn't have much to do with macho. I made two war movies when I was 14 years old. I made one called Escape to Nowhere, which was a kind of a Germans, Americans in North Africa. Of course, I knew nothing about history then, so I, on my film it says somewhere in East Africa. I'm not sure we fought in East Africa. I, as a matter of fact, I know we didn't. And my other film was a film called Fighter Squadron about Air Force. And once again, 13, 14 year olds playing Air Force pilots. I shot it in black and white, my first black and white film. Um, but most of my other films are kind of funny and scary. And uh, so I'm not quite sure that I try to overcompensate for my nerdiness that way. There's a sort of nerdy, uh, cowardly character in Saving Private Ryan, at least at the start, Upham. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you relate to him in the film? Well, I think he's me. I need someone who speaks French and German. Yes, sir. My two guys were killed. Yes, sir, it's just that I've never, I haven't held a weapon since basic training, sir. Did you fire the weapon in basic training? Yes, sir. Well, then get your gear. Yes, sir. Sir, may I bring... May I bring my typewriter, sir? I told Tom Hanks one day, I said, you know, you think I'm you. I want to be you in this picture. Um, I would like to be you, or I'd like to be Sarge, but I think I'm more like Upham. Um, I'm not quite sure what I would do in combat or how I would react. My presumption is I would be more like Upham than I would be like Miller or Riven or any of the other guys. But you never really know unless you're tested. And a lot of the guys who, who, who thought they'd be cowards turned in, in fact, turned out to be heroes. And others who thought that they could take the entire German army single-handed you know, you know, found themselves not able to walk. They were frozen in fear. So you don't know whether you're, until you're tested under those, those kinds of conditions, who you were. But my presumption always was that I was, I would be more like Upham. It's funny if you look at the way Germans have been portrayed in your pictures, of course, particularly Nazis. You know, if you go to Indiana Jones and the Disc Crusade, it's a sort of comic book Nazi, isn't it? And then, of course, you revise this uh, in Schindler's List. Yeah, I'm contrite about that because I've already said, I've already made my apologies when I talked to the media about Schindler's List and, and made my apologies about the Indiana Jones films where Schindler's List kind of um, was a bit of an epiphany for me and I realized that I had been making light of something never to be made light of, which was, you know, Nazi Germany's, uh, you know, oppression over all things free and equal. And so I felt very bad about that after the experience of Schindler's List. I looked back on Raiders of the Lost Ark. I looked back on Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and sort of wished that I hadn't turned Nazis into figures, of, figures to entertain you. Control is power. That's power. Is that why they fear us? We have the fucking power to kill, that's why they fear us. They fear us because we have the power to kill arbitrarily. A man commits a crime, he should know better. We haven't killed and we feel pretty good about it. Or well, we kill him ourselves and we feel even better. It's not power, though. 
That's justice. It's different than power. Private Ryan is not a political movie. It is not about the ideology or fascism. Of course, in the broader picture, if you understand the larger context of history, you know we're trying to, you know, th these boys basically, you know, from all these countries, all the allies, they freed Western civilization. It's an absolute fact. Without that, we wouldn't be talking like this today. I certainly wouldn't be here. Um, but um, but I, I, I think that the German army in our movie, they're Wehrmacht. You know, they're, they're, they're the same kind of level of of foot soldier as our boys are on the same level as foot soldiers. And even though my film only takes an American point of view, as Wolfgang Peterson's film only took, Das Boot only took a German point of view, um, 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 it'd be pointed out that I never felt that we, uh, I, I in any way try to be disparaging about Germany or Germans never making any political statements except the one where the young Private Mellich holds up his Star of David uh, to German prisoners being marched by him. And, and points to himself proudly and says, Yuda, Yuda, Yuda. Without giving away the end of the picture, could you say what the moral conclusion in some way uh, you have drawn is? No, I, you know, I'll, I'll never say that because if I state my intention categorically, then it leaves no room for anybody else to make, you know, draw their own conclusions and, and make their own interpretations. So I've never on any movie stated the theme. I've been very careful throughout. I even had Fellini one day when I, when I first met him in 1972 tell me, when a journalist asks you what's, your, what is, what's the meaning of your movie, make up a different story every time. <laughs> and if you do 10 interviews in one day, tell them 10 different stories. Yes, they'll all be untrue, but you won't, will not have given away uh, 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 you know, what's, what's most important to you, which is much, most personal to you. I never forgot that. Um, I will tell you one thing, this is not the message of the whole movie, but an, in, an interesting theme in this fi film is the question, can you find decency during wartime? And the search for decency, the search for acts of decency, it was something I, I tried to explore with the story. No, 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 we can't take the kids. No, 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 um as I've gotten older I've been I've, I've at least learned I think how to control some of my sentimentality which is by the way it's it's been a tremendous companion to all my life, and it's made a lot of my films successful, but it's also gotten in the way of other films that I inadvertently made sentimental that weren't supposed to have gone in that direction. And I think I, I, I've really learned how to control my need to say it all immediately and in one single image or one single scene, so it makes it a little easier for you to you know, process it and figure out you know, who you are to my film. You know, you, you have to factor in the audience, you know. You can't just say, I make a movie for you, and that's it. you got to factor in the fact that the audience is also helping you make your pictures. They're helping you realize your, your stories, and they're helping you tell your stories by the way they're taking part in the gathering of the imagery and the sounds, and they're processing it, and everybody sees a different movie. So I always give credit to the audience, because if there's a 1,000 people in a theater, Knock on wood, that's nice if there's a thousand, thousand people in a single theater, that's, that's good news. But uh, if that happens, there's going to be a thousand different souls seeing your movie a thousand different ways. And if you, if you make your movie simply one way without any abstraction, any esoteric at all, then you're not, giving, you're not, you're not, you're not respecting the audience, you're leaving no room for them in your, in your life. Certainly my, as a single member of the audience, my... Uh, what I take from your film is that you say, you're saying that there is decency in war. In fact, decency or war produces more decent situations than in civilian life. And when I saw that, I thought of a film that you've talked about, uh, Robert Aldrich's film, Attack, mm -hmm. which, is a, a, which is about cynicism. It's about the way people don't back each other up. Now, that's a, that's a film with more despair in it, I think, yes. than your picture. I'm going to give you something to think about. If I ever lose another man on account of you, 
just one. You'll never see the States again. It's court-martial talk, soldier. I got a witness standing right here. Well, let him hear me too, loud and clear, just so there won't be any misunderstanding. Double-cross me like you did Ingersoll, you. You play the gutless wonder just once more, and I'll come back and I'll get you, Cooney. I'll shove this grenade down your throat and pull the pin. What it and some other war pictures say is that uh, men don't actually cling together at a time of war. It isn't all for one. And um, that seems to contradict uh, what you're saying in your film. Well, well, you know, it depends on, on you know, who you want to believe, really. Uh, um, uh, Robert Aldrich made a movie about something that was important to him. And I made a movie about something that was important to me. And not every, you know, event inside war, there's millions of war stories. Every veteran can tell you a war story that you've never heard before. And uh, some of them are, are very, you know, you know uh, despairing and contra con contradicting. And others are extremely patriotic and filled with valor and cowardice and mixed, just sort of swirling around each other. Is there a danger when you make a film which uh is so full of adrenaline and terror in the first 20 minutes or something. Is there a danger that when you then try to ask the audience to think about some moral questions, that they are so shocked and wrung out by the first 20 minutes that they can't get their mind in gear? See, I don't, I don't think it's important that audiences need to consume and process every moment that they are experiencing. Uh, as they're experiencing it. I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's asking too much of an audience from a director, from a filmmaker. Um, I really believe that a film is going to make a lasting impact on you. You will be thinking about it for days or weeks or months after you've seen a picture. There's a number of films in my life that I, to this day, can't stop thinking about. And I saw them 30 years ago. Um, and, and, I, and every time I see that picture, I, I find something else I didn't, that, that I missed the first time around. So my, th my film is very, very, you know, layered, and and if you don't immediately grasp the moral narrative of Saving Private Ryan, it's something that might come to you a couple of days later, and you'll start to see the values that we try to get up there on the screen. And I'm not asking, you know, you to find those values as you are trying to survive, you know, the mission. I'm simply saying that I know those values will come to you in the shower, or when you're driving your car. It'll happen later. How, uh, big question, how often do you, uh, Steven Spielberg, feel kind of despair, a kind of the utter hopelessness of life? Well, I'm not Woody Allen, let's put it that way. I don't have that kind of despair. I'm probably a hypochondriac the way Woody is a hypochondriac, but I'm not as despairing as Woody. Um, I, I don't, I'm not a despairing person. You know, I'm, I'm extremely optimistic and uh, I, 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 I am cynical only because I live in America and we are a cynical society. And It's and funny because there's no cynicism in your pictures. No, but I'm cynical as a person. Um, um, Why does it not get on screen? Uh, because I don't find real room for it and often I look for stories that, that don't abound in it. And because I live in it every day, I, I somehow need in my own life to escape it. And I sometimes use the movies to escape the cynicism that I exist in every day that surrounds us on the news, on Tell, you know, and it, it just you, you see it, you feel it more, I think, in the states than you do around around the world. Is it is it true that John Wayne tried to convince you not to do 1941? Yes, he did. <laughs> he did. What would he th have thought of Saving Private Ryan? Oh, oh, I think he would have loved Saving Private Ryan. I think he would have respected and honored it. Wayne was a very intelligent man in the sense that he knew the difference between melodrama and 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 reali reality, so to speak. Um, he knew the difference. You're going to get all of us we don't move out of here. We are like, like fish in a barrel lying here. Is this what we've been training for, to take it laying down? Yeah, come on, Sarge, do something about it. You'll stay right where you are until I tell you to move out. I'll do the mastermind around here. I loved him, and I, I think he's a great guy. Um, but Wayne said to me, you're making fun, and you're making a mockery of a very serious time 
when war nerves, war fear of 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 being invaded by the Japanese was running high in everyone's mind. And he said, and, and I read your script, and it's 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 attempting to be a comedy. Wayne said, I for one didn't laugh once, so I don't think you sh should call it a comedy. Uh, but but for the most part, Wayne just gave me a bollocking about that, and uh, we still stayed friends. But he he was just disgusted that I would ever, and he thought the film was anti-American. He, he thought that we were making a very anti-American picture. You are of the Vietnam generation. You didn't, of course, fight in Vietnam. But why have you not made a Vietnam picture? Uh, if it affected your generation more directly? I, I think I can, o I can only tell stories that I'm interested in, and my interest is developed over th all the years I've spent developing it, which is probably all my life. I've always had a direct connection with, with the first, with the Second World War because of my father and because of all of his friends. My dad used to have uh, reunions of the veterans from his squadron at our house about once every three or four years, and 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 growing up, these guys would all come over to the house. There were about seven or eight of them. And over the years, there were fewer and fewer. And they'd all get really drunk, and they'd start laughing and laughing and laughing. And I'd listen from another room watching TV. And then about five, six hours later, you'd notice they were all sobbing. And I don't know if you know how shocking it is to walk into a room as a young boy and see grown men crying and holding each other. Uh, uh, we know that today is, as, as in a word that's called an intervention. When you have an intervention with someone to help someone over a very difficult, traumatic emotion, you, these guys didn't have a psychological network of doctors who knew how to take care of emotionally wounded soldiers co coming out of the trauma, the post-stress of that war. The same way the Vietnam veterans came out of Vietnam with this even worse post-stress trauma because they were spit on and denied employment because of Vietnam as opposed to the World War II veterans that at least came back with the same shock, but they came back accepted and, 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 and treated like heroes. And, and so that war is much more important to me. There were many, many more movies made about World War II that influenced me growing up as a kid. But without Vietnam, I never could have made Ryan as honestly as I did because Vietnam sort of showed everybody and showed, sort of prepared audiences to accept war for what it was, not war as an excuse to romanticize an event. I was in the, the very moving war cemetery uh, above Omaha Beach a few days ago and I, I was very surprised to, to find that a woman came up and asked for Private Ryan's grave and some of the tour guides one of the first things they showed was where you shot the movie. Surely you can say that maybe that's a concerning thing if they're going to there and they're not thinking about a real situation, they're thinking about something they found in the cinema. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's a bad mistake and I think it's a very common mistake. Um, I, I, I think that it's okay, you know, I think it's fine. I was just at Omaha Beach Cemetery yesterday, as a matter of fact, and Tom Hanks and I said some prayers on the beach and we spent some time uh, we had gotten to know the, the Nyland family, and uh, who lost two out of their four brothers to the war, and whose stories are very similar to, you know, our story of Private Ryan. And we spent some time next to the grave of the two brothers, and we spent time next to the grave of the father and the son, whose 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 wife and mother was informed within 48 hours of each other. She got two telegrams within 48 hours that her husband and son had been killed on Omaha Beach. I mean, in in, in, in I'm sorry, in Normandy. Um, I think it's all right because I frankly think that more people are going to come to that cemetery now and they're going to pay their respects and they're never going to look at a gravestone uh, knowing that there is a veteran buried there and, and not in some silent way say thank you for what you did for my generation. You know, I, I, I said early on that, I, that the thing I, I was hoping would be that people would see Saving Private Ryan, and if they ever went past any veteran cemetery, and you know they're, they're all over the world, you know, and not just of the Second World War, but of Vietnam, of Korea, of the First World War, of every war, and just pause a little longer than you paused before you cared about any of these wars, and just look at the cemetery and understand what they did for you. I talked to the, the head of the cemetery yesterday. He spent two and a half hours with us, and he says that people were coming to the cemetery in, in more numbers now, having seen the movie in the States, which has only been playing seven weeks now, uh, and they're not confusing it. They're not, you know, asking to see Tom Hanks or miss, expecting to see Tom Hanks there, although they were surprised to see him there yesterday, I can tell you. 
uh, no, they're, they're going there to pay their respects uh, uh, because I think they they have a significant they had a significant catharsis in a, in a way. I don't want to be pretentious about saying, gee, my movie caused catharsis. But in, in fact, people are seeing the movie, and they are coming out with more respect than they had going in for what those kids did for us 54 years ago. And I think a lot of the people, at least the head of the cemetery, told me yesterday, are coming to pay their respects. One of the most moving bits of film I've ever seen is in a film that you know well, Claude Lansman's film, Shoah. And in the second half of that film, Jan Karski is asked to remember what when he first heard about... Uh, the, the the murders of the Holocaust, and he sits for a moment, and then he said, "I can't go back. I can't go back." Now, now I go back thirty-five years. No, I don't go back, you know, it's a matter of Now, do you think you have made it too easy to, in some way, have a feel of what it was like, the terror of Auschwitz-Birkenau or the terror of Omaha Beach? I hope I did. You know, I, I hope people, you know, certainly understand that it was worse than they thought it was. But what they will never understand is how bad it really was. Only the survivors themselves of the Holocaust will be able to really uh, uh, feel that. But even they can't convey even the most articulate survivors cannot convey what it was like. The Holocaust is, is, is a moment in history that is ineffable. And, no, and Claude Launceman's film Shoah fails to convey what it was like. My film Schindler's List fails to convey what it was like. Elie Wiesel and Primo Le Levy's books fail to convey what it was like. And I have collected 48,000 testimonies from the Holocaust. And all these testimonies, individually or collectively, will never truly be able to let people know what it was like. You absolutely had to go through it because that was something that we'll never know, thank God. And I hope we never know, we never have to know.